So in America and also in Australia, of course, you're lobbying uh, public opinion against the easing of sanctions on Iran. Uh, how concerned should the international community be about the interim agreement made in Geneva? Well, the agreement is, is not a good one. Um, and uh, it increases the chances that Iran will become a nuclear power. And Iran becoming a nuclear power means a few things. It means the entire Middle East will go nuclear because Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear in Egypt and uh, Syria and Libya. You'll have a proliferation of nuclear weapons all across the Middle East. And the ability to control these weapons when, when you have uh, such a concentration of nuclear weapons in, in, in a region of maniacal regimes is, is very small. <clears throat> I, I think if, God forbid, a decade from now a nuclear suitcase blows up in, uh, in New York or a nuclear missile hits uh, Rome, Madrid or Paris, you'll be able to trace it down to a bad deal that, that, that has been made now. But we're looking forward now. I mean, the deal has been signed. But do you think dismantling the machine is a realistic expectation of the negotiations? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, Under what the, circumstances would the Iranians agree to something? Look, uh, only if they have to. Iran... So you mean in terms of sanctions? Yeah. I Iran prizes their program. They've invested tens of billions of dollars o over a decade of uh, work. This is a national program to achieve the nuclear weapon. Back in 2003, they only had 164 centrifuges. Now they have 18,500. And back then there was a UN security resolution that didn't allow them to add even one centrifuge. Mm. And then another resolution and another. And they just breached all through these resolutions. And now, of course, we have to turn back the wheel. Otherwise, it's, it's giving a prize to criminals. They went against but resolution. Do you think that's possible? I do. I think it's possible, but it depends only on Western resolve. If Iran senses that we're not going to insist on it and we're going to be feeble about this, there's no way they'll dismantle. They'll only do it if they have to in order to survive. Does Israel feel that the U.S. has let them down? Negotiations? Look, you know, the, the, this is diplomacy. Uh, the U.S. is a big friend of Israel. Um, the Obama administration has, has strengthened the security and intelligence ties. So this is a, a big friend. The, the, in the negotiations, clearly we uh, thought that a different deal needs to be struck. And uh, hopefully this will be able to be fixed over the next six months. I want to move on to the Palestinian peace, peace talks. It's sure. been widely reported that you said that you'll do everything in your power to ensure the creation of a Palestinian state doesn't happen. Do you see any value in negotiating with Palestinians, though, particularly given last week's comments from former Shin Bet director Yuval Diskin, who said failing to strike a peace deal with Palestinians poses a greater threat to Israel uh, than Iran's renegade nuclear program? Well, you know, uh, Diskin and many other have-beens um, they don't hold responsibility for the security of Israel. Prime Minister Anyone? Netanyahu does. That's right. And um, I certainly disagree with those comments. Look, Israel is negotiating with uh, the PA. And we, the Baytudi party, are sitting in the sidelines, not bothering them. Uh, I told the Prime Minister, you go negotiate. If you achieve the deal that you think is right, you bring it to a national referendum. And if you win, will respect the results. So Israel is a democracy. If, if that's what the Israeli people uh, will decide, fine. Right now, um, I'm focused on building on-ground peace between Palestinians and Israelis through the economy. That's what I believe. Mm. There's two million Palestinians uh, and, and millions of Israelis, and, and we live side by side whether we like it or don't, both sides. And over the past five years, there's been wonderful news going on on ground. I don't think the, the diplomatic route is going to succeed for a simple reason, that uh, Abu Mazen uh, represents less than half of the Palestinians. Okay, The other half in Gaza um, doesn't view itself as represented by Abu Mazen. So let's even assume for a moment they cut a deal, but half of the Palestinians say, but we don't accept it. Mm. What's it worth? Mm. But do you see where he's trying to get at, though, when he says uh, that the you know war with the Palestinians is supremely dangerous for Israel? I, 
I don't want war with anyone. I'm yeah. a major in reserve, and the, the, uh, I fought way too many wars. Uh, what we want is peace. Over the past 20 years, every time we vacated mm -hmm. a piece of land, immediately in return, we mm -hmm. got uh, rounds of, of uh, murders and, and violence where Israelis were, thousands of Israelis were murdered as a result of our evacuating uh, uh, or vacating mm -hmm. uh, land. This uh, formula doesn't seem to work. I just want to want you to elaborate on that a little bit more when you're talking about the withdrawal of Gaza and the consequences of that for Israel. Does that then mean that under any circumstances you would say that freezing the construction of settlements is never a worthwhile endeavour, even if it is to achieve a peace deal with the Palestinians? Look, 93% uh, of the West Bank is open land. There's enough land for Jews and Arabs for 20 generations forward. That's not an issue. The issue is very simple. Do the Palestinians accept a Jewish state in Israel? To this very moment, they're not willing to accept it. Uh, what brings you, a leading member of Knesset, here to Australia? Um, I think m my big uh, vision is in the high-tech sector. And uh, Israel has become a startup nation over the past uh, 20 years. I myself am a serial startup entrepreneur. And I think the combination of uh, Australia and Israel and, and in water technologies, alternative energy, agriculture, cybersecurity, and medical devices, these five areas, I think uh, by creating much stronger bonds in these areas, we can do good. We can do good in Australia, we can do good in other parts of the world. Um, my big mission is what I call a lighthouse mission. Uh, you know, we've got this arid storm in our region that's going to go on for the next 10, 50 years, whatever. But I view Israel as a lighthouse in this storm where we, um, where we uh, can do good. I, I came back from India from a model farm in the, where we have dozen, a dozen model farms. We're increasing cucumber and tomato production tenfold in, in, mm. in regions in India. That's what Israel is about. It's about tikkun olam. And the second aspect is the Jewish community here. Uh, the Jewish community in Australia is involved, is Zionist, is proud, and uh, I'm Minister of Diaspora Affairs. I think it's time to change the relationship between diaspora and, and Israel. Typically we viewed diaspora as one of two things, either a wallet to raise money or of a source for Aliyah. Now, do we want Jews to make Aliyah? Yes, we do. But is that what it's all about? No. We, we respect uh, and, and the, the Jewish diaspora and, and think it's important to strengthen the diaspora. And we think it's time to reverse. Now it's our turn to, to contribute also to diaspora. I want to strengthen that, that bond because it's vital for the, the Jewish existence in Israel and abroad. Wonderful. Thank you for coming to visit us. Thank you.